I'm very excited to hear what your trade idea is. So <laughs> you've kept us in suspense for uh, for this whole episode. So uh, <laughs> well, without any further ado, let's uh, let's hear it. So uh, Ren and Julia, we know we're going through some uh, reasonably unprecedented times in terms in terms of global markets at the moment, and um, you know hitting all time highs and. Uh, we've got central banks doing weird and wonderful things that we certainly haven't seen before or for a long time, and we have interest rates across you know many developed countries in the negative, and we have a trade war on the horizon, if not it's if not already kicking off. We've got currency devaluations happening, and a whole bunch of other uh, things ha- happening in the in the earnings environment across many countries and economies around the world, and so it begs the question: um, as an investor, without I guess being too complicated and going options and all sorts of things. What is a way that you can, I guess, hedge against a fall in the share market, um, both, I guess, domestically and overseas? And so there are a number of stocks that you can choose, ETFs, that really give you the opportunity to protect yourself against a decline in a share market. So My pick for today is Trade Idea and the stock ticker is BBUS, BBUS. It's on the ASX, but what it does is provides the investor with a way to profit from or protect against a decline in the US share market. So it seeks to, it is sort of a a leverage, so it does magnify the returns, but it seeks to negatively correlate the returns of the US share market as measured by the S&P 500 total return. So what that what my idea with this is obviously I'm very much a sort of buy and hold kind of guy I you know thesis if if it generally changes then of course I'll sell but I mean it for the for the longer run from an ETF sort of perspective but I I do like these as a way of coming in and out of and protecting myself against um, any sort of changes in in the share market um, particularly obviously a fall now I wanted to bring this up to just have a more general discussion around why this might be a good move now. And I know, you know, Julia has been speaking recently about the US hedge, the US market trade war and and also more importantly, the yield curve and, and the inversion that's going on. So thought it'd be a good sort of segue into discussing a few of those things. But I guess firstly, from the stock point of view, what are your thoughts? Firstly, that um, with a, a product like Bebus, I think you're right that you're in for a fun time, not a long time. So I think it's no. <laughs> specific opportunities. <laughs> and that's because uh, it yeah. launched on the 26th of August 2015. And since then, it's actually down 75% in value. So you do mm. use it for a specific reason. So in 15 quarters of trading, only two have been positive performances. But having said that, the best quarter is was in the December quarter last year where it was up 36%. And there is a saying in the market that you go up through the stairs and down the escalators or the lift. Um, And that's certainly the case when you do see the share market go down. As you mentioned, it is geared. So if you are wrong, then you feel double the pain. Um, But having Mm. said that, if you have some tools that you can use to help you in timing, then it can be a good product to use because generally speaking, when you're looking at things going down, that things go down a lot faster than they go up. And that could work in your favor with a product like like this. Yeah, absolutely agree. And by no means am I suggesting that you put sort of 50% of your portfolio into a product like this. As you said, it is all about, I guess, more more timing than anything, but it's uh, an option out there for those that are looking to sort of hedge against what they may think is a fall in the market. But uh, Ren, do you have anything on on the stock itself before we jump into some of the fundamentals as to why I'm thinking this? Not on the stock itself. I mean, there's only so much fundamental analysis you can do on it as a security because it really is just a tool to give you access to, you know, to the trade as as you keep calling it. So, I mean, is there any reason why you chose bus as the vehicle to short the US market over another triple leveraged uh, ETF? <laughs> is, is, was there anything particular about this one? Uh, not really, to be honest. There are a number of others through um, some other brokers that you can get 
that are on the US stock market. I know SQQQ is one that is, it's a pro shares over in the States, but BBUS, I just thought from an Australian perspective, it's, it's on the ASX. It's something that I, I know and have owned at various points in time. So no real bias towards it other than that. It is hedged. So I think in this climate, maybe not the best thing to be hedged, but um, essentially that what that means is reducing the currency risk. And also I think, you know, from a liquidity point of view, trading on the ASX has its advantages as well. So yeah, no real reason. Bryce, I really like this because it's exciting and look, it's easy for investors to access because as you mentioned, you can trade it on the ASX just like a stock. Um, just a, a, I guess a word in terms of timing, I've tried a number of different tools to tr- try and time my way. And whether you use options or whether you use uh, a product like this, generally timing is quite important when you're looking at these short-term trades. And what I've found is in my experience that things like fundamental analysis as well as looking at economic indicators, they tend to be a blunt timing tool and they can be quite painful for products like this. So if you look, at, you're looking at a product like this or you're looking at options trading, I do think you need to know an element of technical analysis or charting to help with the timing perspective of this because the gains can be very quick and within, in a very short period of time. Do you... I use everything. From, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> from, from what you're kind of seeing at the moment, I mean, I mean, it's a very broad question, but how, how do you see from a technical point of view you know, this this stock plays in the S&P 500. Are there any sort of technical indicators that you would be looking at closely that I guess are suggesting that this stock might come into play at some point in the near future? Yeah, I think the volatility spiking uh, means that a product like this would probably do well in the short term. And I guess it's, it is some of those macro indicators that are, have has caused that volatility. Um, One of those is the inversion of the yield curve and the major inversion that traders like to look at is the two-year versus the 10-year US Treasury yields. So what we mean by the inversion of the yield curve, it just means that short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates and usually it's the opposite because you want to be rewarded for being in a product for a longer period of time. So this has been the case in the US for a short period of time in the two versus versus a 10-year treasury yield. This also has an impact on business spending. If you think about it and you're a business and you're looking at short-term investment plans and if the short-term interest rates are higher than the long-term ones, you're, you're probably going to put off that investment spending or there's an incentive to put off that spending until interest rates are lower and that can have an impact in terms of the economic environment as well. Having said that, we've seen many inversions of the yield curve. Um, the reason why this one gets in investors a little bit angsty is because in the last 50 years there's been seven recessions in the US and all of them have been um, I guess precursed or the the precursor to those recessions has been an inversion in the yield curve and there's only been one fake signal in that time. Having said that there's been a lag till the time to reach recession from the inversion and um, that lag is generally on average about 22 months so more than a year and a half. So yes clouds are building but having said that macroeconomic indicators can be a pretty blunt timing tool when it comes to things like this so I'd prefer to use something like technical analysis. So Julia can I just pick up on something you said there because we, we've sort of seen, we saw on financial Twitter after the 2 and 10 inverted that uh, a recession is has always been preceded by a yield inversion, or at least recent recessions in the US, have been. Not pre- in Australia, in though. The, sorry, yeah, yeah, in the US. But not every yield curve inversion leads to a recession. When you said that there was just, there's just been one face, fake signal there uh, since these six recessions, are you saying that. Seven recessions. There's. there's yeah. Oh, so there's been seven, is that right? Yes, in the last 50 years. So, so there's, and there's only been one uh, time the yield curve has inverted and it didn't uh, lead to a recession? Yeah, so when you talk about the inversion of the yield curve, don't forget that there are many different dates you can use. You can use the three-month to the 10-year, the two-year to the 10-year, the five-year to the 10-year. So there's a whole lot of time periods that you can use. So often as analysts, we... we 
maybe have a handful, maybe five or six that we're watching. And if we see an inversion in all six, and that's a strong signal for a recession, and if we only see you know, an inversion in the five-year versus 10-year, that's seen as a weak signal. The Federal Reserve of San Francisco actually did a study, I think it was last year, um, to figure out you know, which combination was a good indicator for a signal for recession. And they chose the three-month versus the 10-year. And that's interesting because I think we saw that inverted invert actually in March this year. So we've seen an inversion in that yield curve for a substantial amount longer than the two year versus the 10 year. So look, the clouds have been building and yet we've seen the market continue on to an all time record high since that inversion. So I think the timing aspect of it is a key one. Um, And that's the really weird thing about the share market that you can be 100% correct and still lose money. So, so let me let me move this conversation away from the yield curve because although that seems to be the the bearish uh, indicator of the week, it's by no means the only reason to be bearish at the moment. And uh, we're we're living through a trade war, and uh, we've got tariffs being applied by the U.S. and we've got China devaluing their currency on the other side. Is there any other reasons that you've Look that you've looked to something like BBUS at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, I use the BBUS to trade, but it is used. Uh, it is using technical indicators, not so much macroeconomic indicators. And the reason, as I mentioned, is because um, it can be a very blunt timing tool and difficult to to time and quite painful to hold if you're wrong for a substantial amount of time. So look, we are pretty late cycle, but you know how late we actually don't know. It could be another. 12 months of great share market returns it could be 18 months and to hold a product which is geared to the downside like this without a a timing tool I think can be quite painful if you're only using macro indicators or fundamentals yeah nice I think from my point of view Ren there's not really too much outside of those uh, main things going on at the moment. I mean, we've spoken about the slowdown in earnings environment. I think that's probably one other thing that I would be looking at, but I don't have the technical analysis skills that uh, Julia has. So um, I'm very much relying on macro trends to sort of make my thesis around these things. But you know, as Julia said, this product is very much all about the timing and if we were in it from 2015 then we would have lost a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> Bryce I really like the idea of a product like this at a time like this when volatility is increasing. For anyone mm. who wants some other I guess ideas on what assets tend to do well when um, volatility rises and usually when the share market starts to fall and you're hearing things about production output falling in a lot of places in the world generally they tend to be assets with a limited supply so they can be things like real estate and you've probably already heard that there's been a bit of a revival in residential real estate office um, property has been doing well for a while as has industrial property because they are limited in terms of how quickly you can get these type of assets online the other one is gold which is also relatively limited in supply or commodities which initially during a downturn tends to see quite a big bit of support and then even things like alternative assets like bitcoin what we've seen is um, there's been a bit of a a spike (laughs) um, when volatility hits and if you think about the nature of these if they're a limited supply asset while central banks are printing unlimited supplies of money i guess in the short term you you start to see a bit of money flowing through i'm not saying that bitcoin is a good investment i'm just saying that generally when you do see downturn you see those assets which are limited in supply performing better than the rest of the market. Hmm. Some good insight. We, uh, I think Ren was going to pitch gold as his investment for this uh, mastermind, but we ended up doing a full episode on it. So it would have been a bit of a repeat, <laughs> but um, yeah, certainly um, agree with, with what you're saying there. One thing before we wrap up, Bryce, that I'm interested to get both your and Julia's thoughts on um, mm-hmm. You touched on the decision to go BBUS, which is currency hedged and in Australia. Did you have a think about the currency side of it? Or um, if you did, what, what was the sort of things that went into that decision? Yeah, to be honest, 
I would actually go a slightly different product. Uh, S S Q Q Q would be the one that I, w- I would go with if I was to really carry out a trade like this. This is more just about a, a trade idea, and that's because it's not hedged. I think at this stage, as we discussed last episode or, or maybe the one before, I think in the environment that we're in at the moment with rates falling in Australia and likely to at least remain where they are in, in the States or at least have be higher than they are here, then I can see our currency continuing to underperform against the US. So from a returns point of view, I I would probably prefer to be in one that is uh, unhedged, but this product is is hedged. So um, that's the way it is. Actually, I I like that (laughs) one that you just mentioned even more because it's unhedged. And as you mentioned, when there's times of volatility, generally the safe haven currencies are thought of as the US dollar, the Japanese yen and the Swiss franc. Um, So the Aussie dollar versus those currencies would usually weaken when there's bad economic times or when volatility hits. So as you mentioned, if you're in an unhedged product that trades in the US, you would benefit in terms of currency from a weakening Australian currency as money flocks to the US dollar as a safe haven. Well, Ren and I are actually off to Japan quite soon. So with the no dollar way. falling against the yen, yeah, <laughs> I'm watching my second bowl of ramen slip away with oh, it. Oh, yum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not good for travellers. But anyway, from an investing point of view, yeah, I think that's another whole conversation we could have around how to deal with exchange rates and the sort when it comes to turbulent times like well, this. Well, hopefully but- B-Bus goes really well for you and you'll get to eat lots and lots of bowls of ramen <laughs> with your profits. <laughs> true, true. Or baby bunting, I don't mind. <laughs>